Don't try to sneak into your room like that. I know what you've got behind your back. Records. More no records. Yes, we're recording. So great to finally meet you in person and talk to you. I only know you by your fingers, and, and now I know you by a person. So let me ask you this question. Ha has jazz become too cerebral and too introverted compared to what you do? Well, gosh, I'm going to try to answer questions in brevity because I can be a very long-winded guy. So you got to hold up your finger and say, shut up, Monty. Try to move to the next subject. But the thing about jazz is so, so wonderful, but also perplexing to a guy like me. First of all, I'm a... I'm a self-taught musician. I didn't go academy, conservatory. I didn't study jazz. I just was blessed to have radar to pick up music as a kid all through the years. And I somehow found out how to play the song and the melody. And I saw people loving it. And I said, this, this beat's working. And I started. So I came up in a time where my heroes of music, whether in Jamaica or in America, where I just watched them and was around them, and it was all homogenous, salt of the earth people just telling stories and laughing and talking about, hey man, try this phrase, and it's all a street corner university, street corner. And then in about the 1970s, 1980s, whatever, it became, here's the word, institutionalized, and people say, hey, this music is so special, we got to teach it, we're going to have to teach it. So up came a whole new world of educators, which is a fabulous, fabulous thing. But the, the whole program of the educators and the people who wanted to learn about the music or learn how to play it, they were learning it, learning it in a classroom and how to play this and how do you don't this and all that. So I'm not that. I, 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 I don't even know what chord I'm playing sometimes. I play with what I'm looking for the sound and I'm absolutely sincere about this. So what happened that was all guys hanging out together, maybe somebody teaching somebody something, but a lot of them just neighborhood cats sharing the music, Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker on the bandstand together, whoever, whatever, whatever, just, just that. But then the school teaching program, which has made a better possibility for young people to have a hobby or a, a, a craft, a profession, and there's something, and I can't explain it, that it's like studying classical music. Yeah. So the terrific musicians, there's always going to be incredible innovators. You can't stop that. But there's a whole climate, an environment of studying and performing recitals, whereas that music I grew up with, you could smell it, man. That's how special it was, made you get the goosebumps. You have, to live, you, have, you have to live life, right? You have to go live life. That I mean, I see, I, I see what you did in your in your life, and you were you were here, you were there, you were going into clubs and seeing things happening, and you were moving around. You weren't like in a in a classroom. You're just living it. Absolutely, and really, I was just young, full of fun, gregarious. I guess the once the fancy words passion. I was loving the whole life, the culture, not just the music, but how the world was at the time. You know, I, I, my opportunities that I never seeked, except the joy of being around a musician. And every good thing that happened with me happened to me. It they came to me. It was like a magical light from heaven when I left Jamaica. When when I was in Jamaica and I stuck out of school to go play piano with the old the, the older guys playing the early pop music of Jamaica, reggae, ska, all that. But then I come to America and I'm playing in those bars, those joints with the hustlers and the and the and the, cra the characters and the wise guys and the, the boozers and the, some people carrying guns and you're playing in some bar and the drunk people and hey, play that tune again, kid. You know, and that's the world I came up in. And then a that, wonderful- does that, you, does that make you tough? Does that make you tough when you play in those kinds of places? Well, you kind of develop some kind of Teflon, you know, at least you had the experience to be around people that were dangerous. Yes. You're not around uh, uh, Professor Brown and uh, Mr. The teacher, Dr. This and No, you're around them, them wise guys, you know, you ever really. Them, you ever tell any of them to shut up while you're trying to play? <laughs> well, a couple of times when I got my oats, let's call it, you're feeling, wait a minute, man, I'm, I'm, I'm an artist. You know, you, you just kind of walked off the bandstand because they came, they paid money to hear some guy play the piano, me, right? But normally you're just kind of low key, you're just grateful to have a gig. You're going to get paid. and 
it was a pursuit of a of a prof of a of a life. It wasn't just a mu I'm a professional musician. No, you just happen to play the piano. You're getting a little money. Send home the money to your mother. Make sure she can buy some food at the store, and you're just living on the edge of you're not even thinking about tomorrow. Tomorrow, you were hell. You were like 21 years old, and Richard Bach signed you to a, to a contract or made your first album, and you were 21 years old. I mean, you just sort of seemed to. It, was your life as easy as it looks in recordings that you just glided through things and you went from here to here? To, was it just like that? Michael, you're asking me questions that really get down in my core because <laughs> you you use the you you use the word glided. You, that's a pretty good way to say. I just glide in from moment to moment, and you mentioned Richard Bach. And now here's the thing: in Jamaica, I sneak out of school because I, frankly, not something to be a to be an example for young people, but I hated school. I didn't want to be a school kid. You know, I, I thought I, I already know what to do. And um, I would sneak out of school to go play with the older musicians. And they gave me, well, it got, I got confidence. And when I played the piano, I played it with conviction. It's not maybe I'm going to work this out. Hell no. I just stopped playing. I knew what to do, I think. <laughs> how did you Apparently. know what, what I don't understand is how did you know what to you know I sit in front of a piano nothing nothing happens not even a couple of notes where yeah where, but you see you're an expert with computers oh, no, no. <laughs> okay I'm joking we're joking Maybe, with, I'm, I'm an expert in vinyl records and how to set up turntables I'll go with that uh, far, but, all right but, well I'm, I'm if you ask me history of stuff I'm very good at remembering and I can talk forever and blah 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 but the thing about my thing serendipity here's a word it's great things happening coming out of a out of the heavens i met frank sinatra i didn't ask frank sinatra to do any favors for me he met me and he recommends that i come to new york to play at his buddy jilly's club and i'm, I, I'm playing I read, that, I read that story and it said that frank sinatra had come to this club in where you were playing to see a frank sinatra impersonator did he really have that's time right for that I that's mean... right well you you know sinatra was a guy living life on the edge. He's yeah. performing at the Fountain Blue and he's tearing it up at the Fountain Blue Hotel in Miami Beach. I'm playing in some joint, really, on the bill with the Frank Sinatra impersonator. The previous week before the Frank Sinatra impersonator, Lenny Bruce, the comedian, he's yeah. playing there. And I, I knew Lenny and those were the days oh. Lenny was ducking the law. You know, the yeah. cops were there waiting for him to say something terrible. And, yeah. you know, so I was in that climate of, hey, you know, people living on the edge. And, and Sinatra heard me and his friends heard me say, this kid is he's swinging, you know, let's get him come to New York to play at Jilly's. Hey, Jilly, give him a gig, something like that. So I go to New York, Sinatra. And while I'm at Jilly's, one night, Les McCann walks into the to, to the club and he saw me playing. And we struck up a little hello. He heard me playing. He must have said, hey, this guy is swinging or whatever. And he tells Richard Bach that he should record me. So that's Les McCann. And then a few years later, Oscar Peterson himself, I wasn't trying to play the piano like Oscar Peterson. Nobody can play the piano like Oscar Peterson. But Oscar heard me play, and he must have been impressed. And he tells his record company people in Germany to record Monty Alexander. So Les McCann, Frank Sinatra, <laughs> uh, 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 Oscar Peterson. So all this is, I call it serendipity, because I wouldn't be very good at seeking I wanted to, but I didn't have the nerve to go to people. Hey, man, can I this? Can I? No, I don't do that. You it so just came to me. Nerve. Okay. What? This record. Yeah. Uh, this is a great record, and this is how I actually got really serious into you at the at the Montreux Jazz Festival. And this is on MPS Records, so you were signed to MPS. Is all because of Peterson, yeah. Oscar Peterson. So, but go ahead, go ahead. Many rec many records on MPS, right? Quite a few, quite a few. Yeah, and I went there first in 1974, and I, you know, I got there. And the thing about when I sit at the piano, right away. I'm connecting to this joy thing, you know? Yeah. It's this marvelous gift of, wow, I'm gonna play the piano and I'm gonna feel better about everything. I'm gonna feel good and I'm gonna play that note, not that note, I'm, bam. And when I hit it, I, I make, I'm not me, but this force coming through me is making the observer, the listener, sit there and say, yeah, or groovy, or they start clapping to the beat because I had this sense of rhythm, you know? And um, anyhow, that Montreux record, was um they captured it it's when this i could say when the stars are aligned a good night i'm in a good mood i see the people out there like maybe 2000 in that casino in in uh montreux 76 i got these two 
great guys with me who are going along with my shenanigans because we never rehearsed. We just go play and they followed me. Uh, Clayton and Hamilton, those guys had a bead on me. They wanted to go play with somebody that did a certain thing. And they tracked me down and I ended up saying, all right, let's go. And uh, that was one of many, many nights when I would be playing in front of an audience, small club or a bigger place. And needless to say, Montreux was kind of top of the heap place. You know, it's yeah, like, yeah. you know, and they I, you know, went to this, went to play this, play that, play that, and they just followed me. It's just like, I used to call myself, hey man, I'm like Joe Namath, and these are the Jets. You know, yeah, I'm well, throwing the ball. The you still have that energy. It's incredible. <laughs> you have this well, wow. hey, man, this music thing gave me a whole life, you know, and I tell people this thing kept me out of jail. I could have been a wayward kid because the music, if you have that love for it, you just want to do it again and again. When's the next time I can do this, you know? You hope you get paid re reasonably well, but I never thought about the fame and fortune and I'm going to come up with this new concept. Heck no, I mean, I'm just riding on the coattails of my heroes, Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, uh, Nat Cole, uh, uh, Errol Garner, and the spirit of the music where you didn't just hear it, you could feel it. I guess people were feeling the music. And certainly that night in yeah, summer of 76, yeah. uh, let's just say the force that came through, we it rocked the joint. It so rocked are, you, the joint. are you spiritual or religious or neither? Or just what cosmic? I am. I am a guy. Yes, indeed. As a as a good as a kid, I'm hearing the good news. The good news, the gospel. I'm hearing the gospel. This yeah. mysterious thing called faith. If you believe, and you have the gift to believe it in a way that things happen that you can't explain. I'm not talking about woo woo voodoo none of that. I'm talking about no disrespect to that thing, but. You, I had this, it came, my mother had it. She had the piano in the house. I started playing the notes on the piano. And I would say to this day, when people say, how do you do that, Monty? How do you play that? I said, man, I don't know. And I say this, and I say it sincerely. I pray, and I play. And I literally, that's really all it is. And, and Have you uh, ever hit a, a, a wrong note? I mean, oh, man. Boy, you ain't heard more, more clinkers than me playing the piano. But guess what? I came to a point as I matured, when I said, and I remember praying once, said, God, give me some sense of this music and how to make it have more meaning and da, 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 take me to that. And, and certainly I think that's what happened, right? But yeah. the bad note thing that you just talked about, the clinker, that's a part of it. And I learned that there are no mistakes. Monk said it. There are no mistakes with life, with music, because the mistake happened. And if you're halfway wise, you make that mistake some take you somewhere else right yeah. and um smarter people than me they say that right and you, if you hear miles davis miles is playing a phrase and you get dup, 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 dup. you heard the clinker of clinkers but guess what he's such a, a master of his craft that that mistake became the direction to go in that he may not have intended because he's he can he, he take negative turn it to positive the first time you sat down at a piano when you were a little boy and hit the first note. Did that do it? Did that explode in your head? Is it an immediate sensation that wow? Or did it take four, four year old Monty? Yeah. I can answer that. Four year old Monty, a little goofy kid. It was my favorite toy, T O Y. I started and I go pling. I said, damn, delight. Man, I could, I made my own little sound on this boxing thing, this piano, upright, old upright piano my mom had in the house. She wanted to play piano, but she gave up. She wasn't dedicated. She sang in the choir in the church or something, and she had the piano. But the first time I put the finger plunk, and then I run, if you know about the music, and you take your thumb and you run down the black notes of the piano. You said, just the black, not the white one, the black notes. And you run from the top to the down right away. I said, that reminds me of a waterfall. That reminds me of water coming out of this the rock, you know? Yeah. I must have seen a rock already, or I saw it on uh, in a movie. And I, I start, the music make me dream. I'm dreaming when I'm playing. And um, as I went along, I'm picking, I have an, my ear is developing, and my mom saw that, Monty, you're playing this piano, and I could play the rhythm, and I'm playing boogie woogie, yeah. rocking the joint, and the, the neighbors down the street from the house where we live, or the uncles and the aunts, they come near me while I'm playing and they're going, yay, kids, swing, rock, whatever, you know, and I'm encouraged by this. And I'm sure it happens to so many other 
young people coming up. But in my case, the first time I touched the piano, it was my friend. That piano is giving me a beautiful experience. It's it's my third arm. You know, got the two fingers that I, it's extension of Monte Alexander, and that's how I felt about it. As the as you played better and better pianos, was did that change your experience? I mean, the better pianos give you a different experience? Good question. Yeah, because I was used to, here's a good thing. You're turning a bad thing into a good thing. A lot of those pianos I'd run into were clunky, kind of clunky. It didn't sound so beautiful, but you found, check this out, you find a way to find something that makes you say, man, I was able to take that clunky note and play it in such a way with what other notes I would play that it would seem lovely. So that when I, these days, if I run into a broken down instrument, I, I don't like it, but you kind of find a way to make it work. But needless to say, as you grow, you start wanting to play on the better piano, be it a Steinway grand. And then in my contracts, when I play, please, sir, ma'am, provide a nine foot concert grand Steinway and a Yamaha also is great. So I'm used to that. So if I see a lesser piano, then you go to the promoter and say, hey, man, this piano ain't making it. No concert. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> Have you ever actually done that? Not, not done a show because the piano wasn't good enough? Nah, not really. I talk like a tough guy, but maybe at the end of the day. <laughs> I, would, I, I say, you know what? All right. You know, and I challenge myself. I'm going to make this to work. And I, you don't go to the audience and say, sorry, ladies and gentlemen, those throats, these three notes are missing. Or that note is, you don't tell them that because you're there to serve. Yeah. I believe like we're serving... A, a moment that's going to make th that day better for those people sitting in the in the audience. Because when we do music, it's a great privilege and it's a responsibility to seek the positive. And I just told a friend of mine, I said, I believe, you know, play the play the donut, not the hole. Because <laughs> you can't play the hole. There's nothing, there's nothing in the hole except nothing. It's, so you play what you have that's positive. And, I, and the heroes like, the early guys playing piano, Nat Cole. When Nat Cole started playing piano, in the amount of time he run into a broken down piano, I guess Nat was such a master, he avoided the bad notes and he stuck with what's working. And you, you just yeah. by choice, you do that. But it, it's nicer when you have all the good notes, you know? Yeah. Now you prefer <laughs> playing live in front of an audience rather than recording in a studio, right? Like the opposite. Absolutely. Bill, Bill Evans liked to play in the studio. He didn't want to hear people talking and he went out and I mean, you like to record live, didn't like to be in the studio, and you like being in front of people. That's I feel more comfortable. Yes, it's a moment there where I think a um, little bit of prideful, uh, you know, you know, sharing with the audience. You know, you get a, and I, I like to say, the the audience is the fourth member of the trio. Your yeah. three guys, if you're playing with just you, a bass and a drum and everything, record that audience. You can't actually, you can't tell yourself they don't exist because if they hear it and they applaud in the middle of the song. Hey, don't tell me you don't like that. You know, I've heard of other musicians say, "How dare you applause? How dare you?" Play? What do you mean? We, we can all name names. We know. We, we don't know name. No, God bless. And everybody got. You know, there's that saying from earlier times: different strokes for different folks, right? right? So my stroke is a little less normal than most. You know, but look at here. I don't. End, I tell people I don't know any music. I really don't. I don't read it. I don't know him. Know why? But when I hear Rachman enough concerto or i hear artatum or i hear whoever whatever i go wow that's wonderment i get this sense of wonderment man wow and sometimes i go to the piano and i get inspired by that and wait a minute i just did that that's amazing you know so my whole thing is like the world of surprise and serendipity and a touch of magic and that's you're me play, you play when you sit down and play even though there's an audience there you're playing to please you first, right? Number and one. You have to please you, otherwise. If you got gracious people with you, goodwill people, people of goodwill, the musicians that you ask to help you along the way, right? Yeah. You're playing for yourself, number one. You're also playing for the other guys, you know? And we are playing for the people that spent their money, hard-earned money for some folks, to come, come sitting down there and hear some joker play the piano and the bass and the drum. And I, I feel, pri I was talking to a, pri not to drop names, but I got to know Tony Bennett very, very well. Tony, I became really friendly with this gentleman and 
yeah. sweetest man and so sad the what happens in life to some people yeah. right now yeah. and um he used to tell me but i always believe he says you know it's a it's a privilege to, or we, we were we're so grateful to be able to make music and the people are paying their money you want to give them this thing and let them know you care you know good and some people good impression huh that was a good yeah. impression <laughs> Wait, but and the thing is he starts singing and you never heard a voice that voice is like wait a minute where that voice come from he's saying why you know he's like there but he starts talking like this you know uh, he's talking because you he, he values his voice yeah and um he doesn't want to shout like when miles davis who i got to know well i got to hang out with miles he yeah. invited me to come hang out with him he heard me play i guess he liked it um he was told they had an operation on, on his larynx, pharynx, whatever, because he had polyps. Yeah, yeah. In fact, somebody once said, yeah, did, did you hear what happened to Miles? I said, what? He said, Miles got scallops. No, he means scallops. <laughs> polyps. <laughs> and Miles was in the hospital after the operation. The doctor said, oh, Miles, no, it's better that you don't talk for a few days. But Miles had a temper. And somebody came to visit him, and he, he got angry, you know. And he said, all right, all right writing it down you start shouting at the guy and guess what the consequences for the rest of his life it was like this hey man yeah, yeah, yeah he blew it out yeah. and the same thing happened to julie andrews by the way julie andrews yeah. with that majestic voice wow. yeah i don't know if she was she shouted but the, the operation was the wrong thing to do yeah. and uh this the voice is such a valuable i don't know have, have, have you ever made a vocal recording man i had the nerve to just make my first out and out recording. I've done a little singing through the years. Needless to say, my one of my heroes, shower, Nat Cole. In shower, you know. Well, in the shower, walking down the street, I, I like to think that I was the next Nat King Cole as a kid. But a friend of mine said, hey, man, that's not N-O-T, King Cole. <laughs> <laughs> so I would, but I would entertain myself. And I'll tell you how I first believed that it was a, a song I like to sing. I love the cowboys as a kid, the Westerns. Yeah. Those of us of a certain age, Saturday matinee at the movie theater, you go see Roy Rogers, you go yeah. see Gene Autry. And um, I love those Western songs. You know, you heard that guys were singing back in the saddle again, all that, right? Yeah. And there were simple little tunes. And um, Gene Autry had this very kind of soft voice when yeah. he sang, you know, he says, back in the saddle again. The and I thought, and I heard a record on the radio, I think, kind of a children's song. And I thought it was Gene Autry, because he's the guy that sang Rudolph the Red Nose Reindeer. The kids right. know that, right? Yeah. But it was Nat Cole. And I heard he was singing song, Kimo, Kaimo, some little children's song. And I heard that, wait a minute, Gene Autry. And that connected me at seven years old to the realization that it wasn't the cowboy Gene Autry that I lured, but Nat who yeah. my mother had records in the house of Nat King Cole and they would you know so that was a big inspiration anyhow blah 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 about <laughs> blah, 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 blah. 10 years ago 10 years ago I said you know what I'm gonna do I have an idea that when I just do this next record because I'd made all these albums I'm not gonna I'm gonna do it with a Jamaican rhythm section playing the rhythm the way I like it would be called hey man that sounds like reggae reggae yeah. the beat the beat and indeed, I laid down these tracks, but fully in mind, I was going to play piano on top of it and just melody and a little bit of like, hey, Liberace, you know, up and down the piano, Roger Williams, or just yeah. the piano with that rhythm behind it. No complicated political or human statements about how to make just piano me melody. And along the way, I changed my thinking. I said, you know what? I'm going to have a go with a vocal. And I never did track, trick recording. So just always live right now, here and now, this is it. But on this occasion, I said, no, forget, forget the piano. I'll have the piano in the background when I'm going to sing. And I did a bunch of songs. And uh, it's kind of night that, that you don't know about it. But just about <laughs> August the 19th, I released an album called Love Notes. And there's an original song called Love Notes. But along with that, I, I do Moon River. Oh. I do I do um, uh, The Nearness of You. And wow, back you, ballads, balladry. Ballads, but behind the ballads, you're hearing reggae 
we call it one drop, you hear the groove and you, you move in with that. And instead of putting it in a typical setting it was originally meant to be, I put it in the Jamaican vibe, you know? Yeah. So you want to do this with the music and you hear a reasonable sounding voice, me, coming coming through this whole thing. And I'm singing Moon River and I'm singing The Nearness of You and I'm singing uh, Harry Belafonte's This is my island in the sun where my people have toiled since time. And I'm singing these songs that I loved when I was wow. seven years old. So if you have nothing better to do, check out Monte Alexander, Love Notes. I will it, check it, it out. I'll stream and, it. And don't throw any tomatoes because every now and then I think, you know, I could have did a better job with that note. But hey, to heck with it. You know, there's another <laughs> another pianist, Keith Jarrett. He made a vocal album in the 70s. And, and I reviewed it. And I, I kind of made fun of it a little bit. And I said, uh, you know, maybe you should stick to playing the piano. Right. He, he wrote a letter to the magazine. And I was just kidding around. He wrote a really nasty letter to the magazine about that. Well, there, let me say this. That, you wouldn't do that. You'd let this it masterful, it. masterful, magical, incredible artist, Mr. Keith Jarrett. Boy, I heard him play and I said, man, he's doing what I dream of doing. He made that piano sing. A piano that's the first thing i try to do the piano must sing it must have that even if it's a broken down piano but yeah. keith is a guy that was connected to that but he was always taking himself understandably very seriously very serious and it was almost like if people clapped in the audience he scolded them yeah like saying how dare you clap when i'm playing <laughs> i mean they're loving it they're loving it but he had this attitude about it and i really respect him hey, for his whatever, convictions whatever works but, right Whatever. whatever works but the thing i try not to do and guess what is to take myself too seriously yeah but i take the gift of music seriously because i don't own it it's a gift came to me i don't even understand it i don't really do it so i can't claim it that i'm so you know take it seriously and um, i'm not knocking anybody else but my idea is you know people i've met that loved you know shoot Think of Jimmy Durante, you know, he didn't take it seriously, you know, oh, he's, no. he played the piano and there are other people like, you ever see Chico Marx and the Marx of Brothers, course, of course. Chico, Chico go play the piano man and the kids are standing around him and he's tap, 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 tap. And so for me, the music is all, all kinds of experience, but most important is stay away from the somber and the sad and the, the nerve. stay away from that because Okay, the funeral. You're going to play something at the funeral for the right. loved one that passed away. Okay. Yeah. But the rest of the time, music is something, I mean, not to get too spiritual here, but the Psalms, David's Psalms, I mean, it's jubilation, man. This music, think but of in, the African-American church. In New, in New Orleans, when someone dies, they, they throw a party. It becomes a happy time. Not a sad. And incredible. They, they give some, some respect to the life that just left this world, yeah. Yeah. and they go somberly. But then people can't wait to have a drink at the bar, man. After they put them, <laughs> hey, I want to talk about this. Talk about thing with bars. I want to talk about this record. Yeah. Okay. That's that's an amazing moment for me yeah. because you know you know. Let me say this. I play a gig one night and I said, man, I wish they recorded it that night. It was really blah 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 blah. And then the next time you go play and it's good. Yeah, it's okay. But I wish it was last night. It was recorded. Well. In my history, I have a few of the ones that are like, wow, I was so amazed it came, the power came through and I love that they recorded. But a lot of them are like, hey, that's pretty good. It's okay. Fine. Love You Madly, the one you just held up, was yeah. a happening. And I'll tell you as briefly as possible. I was in Miami and in those days, I'm, I'm hit the band. Every time I hit the bandstand, there's a, a roar of spirit and fire and swinging and piano playing. And it's, wow, how about that? I'm really in my my realm right well i was playing in fort lauderdale and this is way back in 1982 and in miami there was a man named mac emmerman yeah. and mac had the criteria recording studio he had built it and it's interesting because that's the studio where the bgs and uh, people from atlantic records whether it was aretha or whoever whoever they recorded at the criteria but yeah, mac dominoes there you go. All those bands, yeah. yeah. But Mac was a jazz-minded fan. He played trumpet, I think, in a big band. But Mac, I met Mac, and he became a Monty fan. Wow, how flattering. So he knew I was playing at Bubba's, this club in Fort Lauderdale. He said, man, I want to bring the truck and record you remote. 
I said, gee, wow, okay, all right, fine. And he rolled up with the truck, the recording equipment, and the engineer is in the truck, and he's there, and we he just rolled the tape, and it was like I'd been there for several nights. So I'm feeling very comfortable. I had a great team with me, and the music is being played, two nights of session. And at the end of it all, Mac, being the great guy that he was, he passed away, he hands me the tape. These tapes, I mean, they weigh a ton because go back to the years of what, 35 track, 24 track, I don't know what it was. Tape, yeah, two inch tape. Yeah, they, they weigh a ton each. And, you know, and at the end of that, I never really even listened to the tapes. And this is how 82. Can how, can, how could that because, be? Because I didn't have a tape recorder. I didn't have <laughs> well, to, to play 24 track. I bring the serial. A friend, a friend of mine was a fan and he recorded a cassette, you know, just when the advent of cassettes, they were yeah. just coming. In fact, it was Mac that the first time I saw a CD compact disc, I was at his house and he said, look what I got in the mail today. I said, what was that? Look at this thing. I said, this little thing like this. I said, what is that? He said, it's called a compact disc. Look, you can throw it across the room. And Mac threw it across the room to demonstrate that it was not as perishable as a vinyl record. You know what I mean? Is, so, no, it is, but that's all another story. It is pressure, pressure, but but it's this like almost yeah, yeah, yeah. steel, whatever it is. But the point is, he gave me the tape. I put it in his storage room. It sat there, and I said, "Hmm, one day I'll hear it." And and did you forget about it? Did you actually forget? Yeah, because you see, I have boxes, boxes, boxes of cassette tapes of people that recorded me. Some, most of them, without having asked permission. And I had the gumption to have somebody that was with me confiscate the tape because you don't <laughs> you don't have the right to do that. And I have this feeling that yeah. every time you make a musical statement, it's a little piece of your soul. You know what I mean? Yeah, and for somebody just to grab it, it's mine, it's mine. And yes, it's a commercial thing. Like I see all the LPs behind you. You know, it's something of value. So um, anyhow. I had the tape in the storage room, several storage rooms. You move from one place to another. Wow. And I had the occasion to meet Mr. George Clavin. George Clavin, who I knew from the 60s, who, who kind of was a hobby a slash profession, had a recording studio even in the 60s, early 70s called Sound Ideas. And George always would come to a gig where I was playing and say, you know, his, his eyes would widen with enthusiasm. He said, man, you're special or something like that. And I'm, I'm trying not to believe it. I don't want to think I'm special, but I'm oh, too unique. Late. Too, <laughs> too late. late. I'm unique. And George had his record company, Resonance. And he said, I want, and I, so I, he said, you got any old cassettes, recordings? And I said, I guess I do. So I've, I like the idea that music would come out with a guy that cared so much about yeah. the quality of music. Not We're not here to make a lot of money. But we're just here to share the music. And I sent him various things and he he was impressed. I like this one. I like that one. I like that one. And okay, nothing came of that. And I said, Oh, by the way, you know, I have this this old reel to reel 24 track. Da -da -da, <laughs> right. I said, I'm gonna send it to you. And I went to FedEx. We went to FedEx and I sent it to him in, in the FedEx and he got it. And and I guess he must have fallen on the floor when he saw that 24 track tape he must have fallen on the floor i guarantee you he must have gone oh shit. well if he fell on the floor that's part of the the joy of what happened so yeah. he puts the tape on and all i know is i get contact from him and he says monty this is incredible and he starts talking not just about how good the music was Damn. but how the quality of the sound yeah i said really he said what i didn't even write i told him the story of mac emmerman yeah who was a very nice guy and how the whole thing happened and he said man i want to release this and i'll tell you it's the truth it's the truth it's the truth i gave it to him i gave it to chris and said listen don't even pay me put this thing out because for the last 30 years 40 years i wasn't th even thinking about it and it could be a nice thing just to remind people that i exist okay it's you phenomenal know? it's a great it, it should you know it was a record store day special thing but it really should be in in wider release and promoted more it's fantastic i play this well song. you michael you write a letter to george clayman or oh, well. email him and tell him blah 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 because i know it so that recording is me 1982 and i'm playing and everybody's digging it and the yeah. audience is and, and also during those it's a similar kind of release to this mantra years yeah. which just came out on B yeah. bmg people yeah and um 
that happened, the, the, the good people that decided to release this music, it's a collection of tracks called from several performances, yeah. like from 93 or something. But I'd been there from 1976. I'd been there over 20 times to Montreux, it's, you know? It's a special place, right? It's an amazing... I was just there this year. It was incredible. Well, it's I like... See, I got to see all the tape library, and I got to see this many of your tapes. There's like a whole section, large section of your what, tapes. What, what Michael, Claude Nobbs, who was a very unique child slash man, he was like a big kid. He wanted to see people happy. He loved music. He loved started. I mean, the first year in 67, he had Ella Fitzgerald, Basie, yeah. whoever, whoever, whoever. And uh, when you went there, when you say it's a special place, I say it's like Disneyland. You go there and it's like toys and the mountains yeah. and the lake. It's the most <laughs> beautiful area. And the music comes, you know, and every year it's been, what, over 50 years now when they have the festival, it's like, People and now as the world continues and younger people come in and you have yeah. the, the, the little pop groups from all over the world come in there with names like what was that? Who's these people? You know, it's not it's not even you know they have two or three really recognized jazz artists like Herbie Hancock, George Benson might come yeah. the real guys that big audience draws. But in general, it's more like a, 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 an eclectic gathering. But Claude always had this world of love for the jazz you know and yeah. he worked with warner brothers in europe promoted atlantic records he knew the erdogan brothers very well nasui and amit and they made great things happen and inviting the top people whether it was miles or the weather report or bb king just a collection and in the middle of it i get the gig to go there in 1976 all because of mps records and that, that came first, that was your first time there that was my first time. That was my first time. And I talk about serendipity. The first record I made, Alexander the Great, was Richard Buck and Les McCann told him to record me. So you have Sinatra getting me the gig in New York. And you have Les McCann hooking me up with Richard Buck at World Pacific Jazz label. And then you have the one and only Oscar Peterson hearing me and telling the guy at MPS to say, you got to record Monty Alexander. And that's how I got the gig. Yeah. Because these wonderful men of music are telling me, telling people, you got to record Monty, something, something. You know, and I just sat back saying, man, this is like, how is this? Because I wouldn't know how to go to beg somebody for it for a gift. I don't have that personality. I, I don't know. So this magical stuff is happening to me. And I feel like it's still happening in, in my life. In two days, I'm going to Mumbai, India. Wow. Uh, two two weeks ago, I came from Tokyo playing at the Blue Note. So I'm still getting the gigs, but I'm a kind of outlier with music and the scene. I never did the PR people promote this, promote that. I, I, and the little record companies, whether it was World Pacific or later on the beginning of Concord when Carl Jefferson yeah, sure. started it. Yeah. I remember the day he hired uh, the, the man who is now running the whole thing. I was at his house, uh, John Burke. John Burke, yeah, I interviewed him recently. Right, and then then after that, you know, they have these different labels now, but there was no big PR, and, you know, so I'm this guy that, on the one hand, people think is somebody super special, and the other guy, people say, Monty, who? Who is that? Well, that you know? Everybody has that at some point. So, so get, you go to Japan, you still get a big, a big crowd. People, you get a good following. I get a reasonable crowd. The, 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 I was there the very week that COVID started to hit the ah. planet. Oh, that's great. And it was the the, the ship, the princess. I don't know whether Celebrity Line or Carnival. And it was parked outside a docked outside of Yokohama, and they realized there was this contagious thing happening, yeah. and they wouldn't let the people off of the ship. I said, "What the heck? What's going on?" And you know, you realize, uh oh, uh oh. And then we came back to Europe from Japan. And then that's when lockdown stuff started to happen. And yeah. just three weeks ago, I had an engagement. I was over there for eight weeks and we had a pretty good turnout. But it's still people coming out of this, don't go out too much and hang out. But so we had a pretty good crowd. In fact, one night while I was there, this wonderful lady who is the ambassador from Jamaica to Japan, uh, Shorna K. Richards, ambassador. She was so pleased that I was coming to play there. And and by the way, just now I received from the government of Jamaica, Order of Jamaica, a very distinguished nice. award. So, hey, I, I received it 
graciously, but hey, I'm still at it. You know, I'm out here hit, hitting do you, it. Do you go back I, to Jamaica? Do you do you go back to visit? Yeah, I was here, but but uh, just let me finish this. So yeah. Sharna, our ambassador, she invited a whole bunch of ambassadors that she was friendly with. So the Blue Note <laughs> we're playing is, is the ambassador from Ecuador, from Peru, from Chile, from Mexico, from Israel. I'm talking about Angola. And among them is Ram Emanuel, oh. who, who is now the ambassador of the United States ambassadors. I had all these ambassadors and their wives <laughs> in the club with the Japanese folks. So it was a wonderful time. And to answer your question, yes, I go back occasionally. And it's a great going home moment. I've played little concerts there. And um, they're doing a documentary right now on my story, which is kind of wacky, unusual. You know, guy from Jamaica came to America, blah, blah, all this, all that. So Seems I've been going good. there. If that's, a rocky, if that's a rocky road, I think we would all be blessed to have such a rocky road. <laughs> so you I, mean my, the road I've traveled? Your whole story. Yeah, it's a great story. Yeah, well, thank you for that. And I guess, you know, just... I have this philosophy, keep moving, meaning, meaning if you're moving, you know, they can't find you. <laughs> yeah. You have it. You have this Jamaican thing. I, you know, I went there the first time in 1972 and it was like a magical experience. The, the, the love of people. It was, it's, it was, and the second time I went back, it was the same way. And you had, you exude that in, in your music and every, and now I'm, get to talk to you and it's, it's I'm delighted time. well you're a very pleasant gentleman and a big meeting you Michael and um I guess you it's almost like you do a radio show what's your main source of activity I used to do radio in the 70s I got thrown off a couple of times because I was a bad boy but I, not to, anything that I did then you can do now but I couldn't do it then and I, so I'm a writer and I write and I do YouTube videos and I write and I did stand-up comedy for a while that was fun and uh, and I do this, and so this is great. I'm enjoying myself because we're pretty much at the same age, and uh, we're having a good time, right? It's get, it's good. Uh, did I tell you when I was working in Miami the, the time I met Sinatra when he called me over the table? Just before that, the performer was who I got to know. I'm dropping names now. Was Lenny Bruce? Uh, I got to know. That, yeah, I, wow. You know, I remember being around him, and you know, he was struggling with the the substance things you know but he was real cool he liked he liked jazz his best friends one of yeah. his best buddies was philly joe jones they used to right. sit around and imitate bella lugosi doing dracula <laughs> he says i want to fuck your blood he'd do that <laughs> <laughs> that's right i think there's some lenny bruce doing drag doing bella lugosi yes okay. absolutely absolutely but no it's a pleasure to meet you and Thank i do you. these interviews and sometimes it's like wow what a, what a lot of fun Talk. Where are you residing? Where are I'm you at? Jer I'm in New Jersey. All right. Okay. And where do well, you I'm in. I'm right here in the city, oh. Midtown, where I came in the '60s, and in and out between here and Florida, when my mother was living in Orlando. But my my home is a Samsonite suitcase. Yeah. I keep I keep moving, and the piano is the destination. Well, next time you're playing in New York, I'll come see you. I'll be at Birdland, oh. on um. December 20 to 24. Really? Please try to come. Birdland. Not, well, not try to come. I'll, I'll get there. I'll get well, there. darn right. And how do you spell your last name, Michael? Excuse me. F-R-E-M-E-R. Framer. 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 Yep. Okay. And I want, and by the way, a little comment about the Montreux years. Yeah. I, I you may, may have listened to it, but these are yeah, different did. years. Among them, there seem to be the, the, folks who put the music together they chose a version of me playing in the incredible Stravinsky concert hall and I'm playing this old folk song and I got Ed Thigpen on drums with me and he's laying down a wonderful version of a call it African rhythm Ira Coleman and we're playing a folk song way preceding Bob Marley and reggae and that their folk song called Linstead Market and they're taking that song and they're playing on the radio and they're promoting it and I'm proud because it has to do with my heritage you know yeah. and um, the, there's the CDs as well as the LP so it's a nice thing that happened thanks to BMG and a fellow by the name of Mr. Fraser Kennedy he put the whole thing together and Excellent. I congratulate him yep yeah well, and I'm great. meeting Look, you today it was a pleasure talking to you it was an absolute joy it's like listening to your music that's what it's like so thank, thank you, you for taking the time to talk to me and I will, I will definitely come to Birdland and I will see you well, I look for you and please identify yourself. Hey, Monty, I'm Michael, blah, blah, blah. I Go will. from there. I Take will. care. Okay. I made, a, I made a new friend, you. Okay. Same here. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.